Good evening and welcome to all of you. My name is Kim Rossi. I'm the Director of Philanthropy at Pathstone Foundation located in Niagara. Thank you for joining us from your home tonight for the white and bright free live stream event. Special thanks to RBC. Their commitment helps us cover the cost of this live stream event, allowing us to offer it to you absolutely free. To those of you who are not familiar, Pathstone Mental Health is a not-for-profit organization supporting the mental health needs of children, youth, and their families from birth to age 18 across Niagara. The COVID-19 outbreak has brought an unsettlement to many of us. Our health, safety, and finances were all threatened simultaneously. There can be fear with the unknown, and at this point, we don't know when we will be able to resume life as it once was. But let's be here and present tonight. Tonight's about you. It's about your family. It's about connecting in the most authentic way that you possibly can, and Dr. Chapman's going to help us with that. A few short weeks ago, we took our in-person gala, The White and Bright Affair, which spoke to a dress code of wearing white with a splash of your favorite color and converted it to what you'll see tonight. I know some of you are playing along. You're wearing your whitest and brightest attire tonight. Uh, the bonus of attending an event in the comfort of your own home. Casual is king, shoes are optional, and maybe you're wearing what you were wearing yesterday. Dr. Gary Chapman is our keynote speaker tonight. He's the author of the best-selling series, The Five Love Languages. It's sold over 12 million copies, and it's been translated into over 50 languages. Dr. Chapman has traveled the world hosting seminars about marriage, family, and relationships, and his radio program airs on over 400 stations. Tonight, he's going to talk to you about your love languages and the love languages that are living in your house through COVID-19. They're likely not all the same. And for the past few weeks, you've been living with your housemates 24-7. What has that been like? Feel free to let us know on any of our social media platforms in the comment section. In addition to Dr. Chapman's keynote, each year at Pathstone's signature event, we talk about mental health and what it looks like. We know the need grows every year in Niagara, and according to the statistics we're sharing with you tonight, the need in Niagara, Canada, and across North America is all very similar. There's a lot of good that has come from this outbreak. It's definitely easy to see the pain points, but there's also so many generous hands and hearts across the globe who've sprung into action to help. Let's take a look at a few of the truly impactful actions. Well, there is no cost to you tonight to view the live stream. We'd ask you to help support the kids that rely on Pathstone. Click the Donate Now button at any time throughout the evening to make a charitable donation. You will be e-receipted for your gift. With that said, we also have a generous gift match in play tonight. Your donation will be matched dollar for dollar up to $10,000 thanks to a group of philanthropic supporters. We thank them and you for your generosity. I'd like to share with you a particularly touching story of a local family who leaned on Pathstone for support and healing after they suffered a tragic loss.
My oldest son, Ben, passed away tragically at the age of 19. When Ben died, it affected Liam instantly because he was just broken beyond words. He goes to see her at Pathstone every two weeks. Her name is Angel, and she is an angel. She gives him all the tools he needs to get through another day, through another week, through another minute sometimes. Pathstone has helped Liam so much. He's got his good days and his bad days, but he's doing pretty good. All funds raised during tonight's live stream event will be directed to supporting the services that Pathstone Mental Health offers to children and youth right across Niagara, including our 24-7 crisis and support line. That line has stepped up through COVID-19. When our doors were closed over three weeks ago, it affected 14 sites where Pathstone Mental Health offers services to children and youth across Niagara. We've put extra people on those phone lines, and you can call at any time, 24-7, 1-800-263. 4944. What does it look like at your house tonight? We'd love to see your pictures. Post pictures of your white and bright live stream event at home on social and please tag us. Tonight, Dr. Chapman brings the five love languages to life in a very different way. We are all affected by COVID-19 and the orders to self-isolate at home. Some provinces and states have state of emergencies in place. New York is in a state of disaster. Others have issued a shelter in place, which is an order and an effort to compel residents to stay exactly where they are and limit movement. These measures are all efforts to minimize the severity of this pandemic and preserve lives. As we sit tight at home and follow the orders, it can become increasingly difficult for all of us to see those wonderful qualities and charm in all of those people that we're living with. Tonight, Dr. Chapman will give you some new tools in order to stay connected and still feel the love in the best way we know how. If you have any questions for Dr. Chapman, you can do so through the comments section on any of our social platforms and we'll answer them after his chat. We're gonna connect with Dr. Chapman live from North Carolina. Well, hello, Kim. I want to tell you about a very, very special guest that will be joining us after the Q&A tonight. He's a Canadian country superstar, a two-time Juno Award winner, a CCMA Male Artist of the Year and Fan Choice of the Year. He was honored on the Canadian Walk of Fame, and he's the only Canadian artist to ever open for Garth Brooks. Later tonight, Mr. Brett Kissel will join us with a special performance. But now we'd like to go to North Carolina, where we join Dr. Gary Chapman, for a little more on the love languages and COVID-19. Hi, Dr. Chapman. Hi, Kim. It's good to uh, be with you tonight and with all those who are watching and listening. Uh, delighted for what you guys are doing there uh, in terms of helping children and teenagers uh, with mental health. Uh, tonight, uh, I want to tell you what I hope is going to happen in the brief time that I spend uh, with you. Uh, if you're married, I hope your marriage will get better. If you have children, I hope your relationship with your children will get better. And if you're single and have at least one friend, I, I hope your relationships will get better. So that's my desire. I also hope that uh, you'll learn some things you'll find so helpful, you'll want to share them with your friends who are not listening tonight and watching, but who desperately need what we're talking about. And my third desire is we can have a little fun while we do this, okay? I'm gonna talk about the most important word in the English language and the most confusing word. I say that love is the most important word because if you examine our literature, our music, our theater, our religions, you'll find that love is a central theme in all of them. But love is such a confusing word because we use the word love in a thousand ways. We say, for example, I love hot dogs. Or in North Carolina, we say, I love barbecue. And then I hear people say, oh, I love the mountains. Oh, I love the beach. I love my new car. I love my dog. And then we say to a special someone, I love you. Hot dogs and barbecue. Oh, I'm not going to talk about a thousand ways in which we use the word love. I'm going to talk only about one way in which we use the word love. And that is love as an emotional need. Almost everyone agrees that our deepest emotional need as humans is the need to feel loved by the significant people in our lives. 
If you're married, that's your spouse. If you genuinely feel loved by your spouse, life is beautiful. You can walk through the crisis and you'll probably make a, a good thing of it. If your children feel loved, they'll likely grow up emotionally healthy. So it's an important thing. Now, how do we do that? How do we love effectively? How do, how do we meet that emotional need for love? The difficulty is we have made an assumption that whatever makes me feel loved will make someone else feel loved. And that's a false assumption. Never forget the first time I encountered this in my office. A couple came in to see me. I'd never met them. I found out later they'd been married to each other for 30 years. She started speaking immediately and she said, Dr. Chapman, let me just tell you a little bit about us before we get started. She said, we don't argue. We don't believe in arguing. We don't have any money problems. And she went on with two or three more positive things. And then she started crying. And she said, but the problem is, I just don't feel any love coming from him. We're like two roommates living in the same house. He does his thing and I do my thing. There's nothing going on between us. And I feel so empty inside that I don't know how much longer I can go on like this. Well, when she finished, I looked over to her husband and he said, I don't understand her. I do everything I can to show her that I love her. She sits there and tells you what she's been telling me. She doesn't feel love. He said, I don't know what else to do. I said, well, what do you do to show your love to her? He said, well, I get home from work before she does, so I start the evening meal. And sometimes I have it ready when she gets home. If not, she'll help me. And then we eat together. And after dinner, he says, I wash the dishes. And every Thursday night, I vacuum the floor. And every Saturday, I wash the car and mow the grass and help her with the laundry. And he went on. I was beginning to wonder, what does this woman do? <laughs> it sounded to me like he was doing everything. And he said, I do all of that. And she says, she doesn't feel love. I don't know what else to do. I look back at her and she started crying again. She said, Dr. Chapman, he's right. He's a hardworking man. But we don't ever talk. We haven't talked in 20 years. He's always washing the dishes, mowing the grass, vacuuming the floors. <laughs> you understand what's going on? A sincere husband who's expressing love to his wife, and she doesn't get it. And after that, I heard similar stories over and over in my office. And I knew there had to be a pattern to what I was hearing, but I had no idea what it was. So eventually I took time to sit down and read several years of notes that I made when I was counseling and asked myself the question, when someone sat in my office and said, I feel like my spouse doesn't love me, what did they want? What were they complaining about? And their answers fell into five categories, and I later called them the five love languages. And I started using that in my counseling. And helping him understand that if he wants her to feel love, he's got, he's got to express, express love in her language. And if she wants him to feel love, she's got to express love in his language. And then I realized rather early on, this applies fully as well to children. And I would help couples learn each other's language, challenge them to go home and try it. Sometimes they would come back in three weeks and say, Gary, this is changing everything. The whole climate's different now. But tonight, I want to focus on how this relates to children and teenagers. I believe that inside every child, there's an emotional love tank. And if the love tank is full, that is, the child genuinely feels loved by the parents, the child tends to grow up emotionally healthy. But if the love tank is empty and the child does not feel loved by the parents, the child will grow up with many internal emotional struggles. And the teenage years will often go looking for love typically in all the wrong places. I think adults also have a love tank, and I think the same principle is true. Much of the misbehavior of children goes out of an empty love tank, just as much of the misbehavior of adults grows out of an empty love tank. So I want to talk about how do we keep the love tank full? And I don't know anything more important in family relationships as we walk through this crisis than keeping the love tank full. So let me share briefly the five love languages. If you've read the book, it'll be a review. If you haven't, it'll be an introduction, okay? They're in no particular order. Number one is words of affirmation. Using words to affirm the child or affirm your spouse. You look nice in that outfit. 
You know, you did a good job on that art. You know, one of the things I like about you, it's simply using words to affirm the child. Uh, you know, there's an ancient Hebrew proverb that says life and death is in the power of the tongue. We can kill people by the way we talk to them, or we can give them life. For some people, words is their language. If you use their language in a negative way, you give them harsh, cruel words, it's like a dagger in their heart. A second love language is acts of service, doing something for them that you know they would like for you to do. The gentleman I just described, he would speak in acts of service to his wife. Now with children, we're forced to speak this language when they're little because they can't do anything for themselves. We do it all. We put the food in, we take the food out, we, we do the whole thing. Uh, but it may be mending a dress, a doll dress for a child. Again, depending on the age of the child, or perhaps repairing a bicycle chain, or teaching a teenager how to do something that they really want to do, an act of service. Incidentally, as they get older, we teach them how to do things for themselves. That is a greater act of service, and that takes even more time and energy. To teach a teenager or a young person how to cook is a lot harder than, teaching, than cooking yourself for them. But if this is their love language, they feel love when you do things for them and teach them how to do things. A third love language is gifts. It's universal to give gifts as an expression of love. The gift says, they were thinking about me. L look what they got for me. The gift doesn't have to be expensive. You know, I sometimes say to husbands, you can get flowers free in the springtime and summer. Just go out in your backyard and pick one. That's what your kids do. How many mothers have ever received a dandelion from your kids? Yeah. Now, guys, if you don't have flowers in your backyard, your neighbor's yard. But ask them. They'll give you a flower. <laughs> or you could be taking a walk in a city parking lot and pick up a feather, a bird feather, and bring it home to your wife and say, honey, I found this today, and I thought about you. You are the, you are the wind beneath my wings. Girl, I love you. Woo! <laughs> if gifts is her language, she got it. You can pick up a stone in a city parking lot and take it home and give it to an eight-year-old boy and say, hey, I found this today, and I thought about you. Look at the colors in this thing, man. I wanted you to have it. If gifts is his love language, You'll find that stone in his dresser drawer when he's 23, and he'll remember the day you gave it to him. A fourth love language is quality time. Giving the child your undivided attention. I do not mean simply being in the same room. I mean, we're all in the same house now. <laughs> we have to stay in the same house. I'm not talking about proximity. I'm talking about giving the child your undivided attention. What you're doing is not nearly as important as the fact that you're giving them your attention. It can be simply having a conversation, talking about when you were their age, some of the things you did when you were their age. It can be helping them put a puzzle together. It can be uh, uh, helping them do uh, an art project or playing a game with them. But the child has your undivided attention, not television, not the computer, but the child. And then number five is physical touch. We've long known the emotional power of physical touch. That's why we pick up babies, hold them, kiss them, cuddle them. Long before the baby understands the meaning of the word love, the baby feels love by physical touch. So the basic concept is this. Out of those five languages, each of us has a primary love language. One of these speaks more deeply to us emotionally than the other four. We can receive love in all five. But if we don't receive love in our primary language, we will not feel loved, even though the other person is expressing love in one of the other languages. So th that's the key, to discover each other's love language and then choose to speak it. Now, some people say to me, well, Gary, wait a minute. What if the other person, the child or your spouse or, or a friend, what if their love language is something that's just, it's, it's number five for you. It's just not important to you at all. Well, the learning curve will be higher but the good news is you can learn to speak all five of these languages as an adult, even if you didn't learn them as a child. That's the good news. So learning a child's love language and choosing to speak it. And if you have two or three children, they probably have two or three different love languages. Don't assume that what makes one child feel love will make another child feel love. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting 
that you only speak the child's primary love language. No, heavy doses of the primary language, sprinkle in the other four, because we want the child to learn how to receive love and give love in all five languages. That's the healthiest adult. But most of us did not receive all five growing up. So some of us came to adulthood and we never learned how to speak these languages, but we can learn to do that. I remember the husband of the father who said to me, Gary, I read your book on the five love languages of children and, and, and my son took the quiz and his love language is physical touch. But my father never hugged me and I've never hugged my son and I don't think I can do it. I said, okay, stand here beside of me and put your hand out and hit me on the shoulder. And he did. I said, that's your homework this week. Just go home and hit him on the shoulder one time and you can run. <laughs> if you have to hit him, run. <laughs> and the next week we added a little pat on the back and we took three or four of those steps each week. And I'll never forget the day he walked into my office several weeks later and he said, Dr. Chapman, I hugged my son this week. I hugged him. It felt so good. I hugged him. <laughs> if it felt good to him, you imagine how it felt to that son. So learning the love language and choosing to speak it is a, is a powerful, creates a powerful bond between you and that child. And you're creating the best possible atmosphere in your home. When the husband and wife are speaking each other's language, and together individually, they're speaking children's love language and the children have the concept and they're learning how to speak each other's love language and learning how to speak dad's love language and mom's love language. Imagine what happens. You create a climate in the home that is super, super positive and you can walk through the crisis that we're in right now and make not only just survive, you can thrive in this situation. Now, people often ask me, well, how do you discover a child's love language? You can discover a child's love language by the time they're four years old, simply by observing their behavior. How do they express love to you? My son's love language is physical touch. When he was five years old, or four or five, I would come home. He would run to the door, grab my leg and climb all over me. He's touching me because he wants to be touched. Our daughter never did that. At that age, she would say, Daddy, come into my room. I want to show you something. She wanted quality time. She wanted my undivided attention. Now, they're adults now, and that's still their love language. I remember when they were teenagers, my daughter would say to me, Dad, can we take a walk after dinner? I'd say, sure, honey, as soon as I wash dishes for your mama, <laughs> because my wife's language is acts of service, make mama happy, <laughs> and then you and I can take a walk. My son would never walk with me. He said, walking is dumb. You're not going anywhere. If you're going somewhere, drive. <laughs> what he would ask is, Dad, can we play basketball? Because the way we played basketball in the backyard, it was physical. So learning the love language of a child, choosing to speak it, giving heavy doses of the primary language, and then sprinkling in the other four so that the child feels loved and they're learning how to speak the other languages, which will make life much easier for them when they get to be an adult because they will likely marry someone who has a different love language. So if I can just throw this in, you know, as we entered this crisis, there were some families that were rather healthy. In fact, there are a lot of families that have learned exactly what I've been teaching tonight. And, uh, and they're, they're making the most of it. They're spending time with the kids. They have a reading time and they have play time and they, they, they're organized together. They get, they're, they're enjoying this. They go look back in 10 years and say, wasn't that great? <laughs> But if you had a rather fractured relationship with your spouse or with your children, uh, and, and it can not only be young children, it can be older children, maybe even children that aren't in the home now. We have a fractured relationship. Then we go through a crisis like this. It's much more difficult. You see, a husband and wife who had a fractured relationship, when they were going to work, you know, they were apart more than they were together. So they could tolerate each other. I mean, they could be civil to each other while they were together. But when you're thrown together 24-7, that's a whole a totally different story. And the children, you know, they were gone for a good part of the day in school, but now they're home. So we're, we're, we're trying to do the teacher thing, working with the online teacher. And incidentally, I think a lot of us appreciate teachers much more now, <laughs> those of us, that have, those that still have children at home. But, you know, when you do this, 
when the children get to be adults, it's absolutely incredible to see them relating to their children in a positive way. Now, some would ask, well, Gary, what, what if you haven't had a good relationship with your children or, or even with your spouse? Uh, is it too late? It's never too late to begin to love a child in the right love language. But it probably needs to pre be preceded by an apology. Imagine saying to your 13-year-old son or daughter, you know, honey, I, uh, I've been thinking a lot about us. And I know that I have not been a perfect father or mother. I've been thinking about some of the ways that I've let you down and some of the ways I've hurt you. And you just began to apologize for some of those things. And, and I have the feeling that you don't feel my love. In my heart, I do love you, but I know I've not always treated you with love. So I wanna ask you to forgive me. And, and I've learned a concept about love languages, that everybody has a love language. And I'd like for us to kind of learn how to express love to each other. So mom and I, or dad and I are gonna take this quiz online. It's free, fivelovelanguages.com, it's free. And we're gonna learn how to love each other better. And I, I don't, I'm gonna ask you if you would be willing to take that quiz as well, because there's one for teenagers. And I'm gonna ask your brother or your sister who you know is younger to do the same thing for children. And then we're gonna talk about this and we're gonna see if we can't really communicate our love to each other in a more meaningful way. Are you on board? Chances are that teenager is gonna be on board. I remember a 13 year old teenage boy had run away from home. He sat in my office and said, my parents don't love me. They love my brother, but they don't love me. I knew his parents. I knew his parents loved him. Problem, they didn't express love in a love language that spoke to his heart. You see, the question is not, do you love your children? The question is, do your children feel loved? I hope what I've shared with you today is going to enhance your relationship wherever you are in the journey. Whether you've got a super healthy family already, I hope if you'll apply this, it will enhance, it will enhance things. Or if you have a troubled family relationship, I hope that you'll take some steps in this direction. And incidentally, this applies in all human relationships. I just released a book this year, actually, for those of you that might be in a blended family, it's called, uh, in fact, I don't remember the title. It's called Building Love Together in Blended Families, The Five Love Languages of Becoming Step Family Smart. So if you happen to be in a blended family, you might want to check that one out too when you go to fivelovelanguages.com because the dynamics are a little different in a blended family and also in adopted families because you haven't got the bond, the emotional bond that a biological parent has with the child. And so we talk about how do you navigate those waters because they may not just read, readily receive their love language. You have to start uh, you know, with, with kind of the lower level of intimacy and kind of build it up, but you can do it. And I really believe that this could enhance a lot of blended families. So uh, I'm gonna stop there and we, I think we're gonna move to some questions. And uh, hopefully if you have questions, you've already submitted them or maybe will. And uh, Kim, I'm ready if you are. Okay, I'm so glad. Okay, so. Uh, a couple of questions. One that kind of popped into my head right away. If you've got somebody that doesn't want to take the love languages quiz, is there another way to sort of figure out which of the five love languages they may be? Uh, yes. You know, I mentioned the one, observe how they respond to you or respond to other people. But here are two others. What does the child complain about? Or what does your spouse complain about? The complaint reveals the love language. I remember the six-year-old boy who said to his mother, we don't ever go to the park anymore since the baby came. Quality time was his language. He and his mother used to go to the park together. He had her undivided attention, but since the baby came, they're not going to the park. He just mm -hmm. told her his language. What did they complain about most often? If they say to okay. you, for example, if a child says, I can't ever please you, they're telling you that words of affirmation is their language and they don't mm -hmm. hear those words from you. So what does the child complain about? And then what do they request most often? If they're saying, can you give me a back rub? They're mm -hmm. asking for physical touch. 
If they say when you get ready to go on a business trip, be sure and bring me a surprise. It's their love language. They're asking you for a gift. Uh, mm -hmm. And that particular child, if you come home without a gift, they will complain. You didn't bring me anything? <laughs> so uh, those are three ways. Observe their behavior, what they complain about most often, and what they request most often. It, that works with a child and also with an adult. Okay, great. Uh, we've got a question from Erica via Twitter. Uh, Dr. Chapman, what does it mean when you have three primary love languages? On my quiz, I got three love languages that are all equal numbers. What does this mean for me as a person and for a future partner? Thank you. Okay, it means that any one of those three is going to speak deeply to you. And it probably means that you got all three of those growing up. So if you feel loved in a relationship, it's probably because the person that you're relating to is speaking all three of those. But, but it's, uh, I've said, it's often, often number one and number two are close. It's not always that number three, three of them would be the same, but number two and number one often are pretty close. And I, I call those people bilingual, which means either one of those is going to communicate. But uh, your spouse or whomever you relate to, if they have the information, any one of these things is going to be really important to me. That's great. They've got the information they need to communicate love to you in a meaningful way. Okay, I think that is all the questions that we have via uh, social media platforms. I think your, your uh, talk to us was more than uh, fulfilling and complete. Thank you for your guidance in this very, very challenging time, Dr. Chapman. It was a pleasure to meet you and talk with you all of these weeks leading up. Well, thank you. And keep up the good work that you're doing at Pathstone. Thank you. There's still time to donate. As we mentioned earlier in the evening, uh, we have a $10,000 gift match in play tonight. So if you make an online donation, it'll be matched dollar for dollar up to $10,000. I think I can take the headphones off now. <laughs> I'd like to again thank our sponsors for this evening. Uh, we wouldn't be able to offer it to you as a free live stream without them. Our presenting sponsor, RBC, um, as I mentioned, without them, not possible. Kojiko, Allstate, DJV, Bosch Rexroth, Hornblower, Janice and Robin Digital Communications, Bill Augerman, and Haskell Photography. I'd like to introduce you now to a dear friend of mine. We met a, a few years ago, and when I asked him if he'd be interested in being part of this live stream tonight, he didn't hesitate. I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Brett Kissel, who's going to share a very special performance with you tonight. Hi, everybody. I'm Brett Kissel. And during this crazy time, this uncertain time, what I'd like to do is I'd like to lean on music and I'd like to ask that you all enjoy the lyrics of this song and what they truly mean because I hope that this song does inspire hope and peace and love to each and every one of you. It's a song I wrote called Tough Times Don't Last, Tough People Do. Dressed up underneath that old old tree The day we laid my grandpa down For all my life I'd been a shadow As a little man I was learning what hurt was all about That was the first time I ever saw my daddy cry and he said, son, that's the thing about life. Yeah, the rain's going to fall on us all. Your heart's going to break sometimes. There's no way around it. Life's full of mountains. You're going to have to climb. But there ain't no crime in crying. You just got to keep on trying. So remember, no matter what you're going Times don't last, tough people do. Baby, it's been all smooth sailing since we fell in love. But lately, we've been on a rocky road. But if I know you like I think I do, you ain't giving up. And there ain't no way in this world I'm a letting go. 
God put us together and he don't make mistakes and love is gonna be our shelter from whatever comes our way yeah the rain's gonna fall on us all our hearts gonna break sometimes but there's no way around it life's full of mountains we're gonna have to climb but there ain't no crime in crying we just gotta keep on trying so remember no matter what you're going through tough times don't last just gotta keep on trying so remember no matter what we're going through tough times don't last tough people do tough times don't last tough people do tough people do Thanks so much, Brett. We thank you for watching tonight. Be well, keep each other safe, and remember, Pastone is just a phone call away. Good night.